again. Well, we have another exciting session ahead. Public speaking is not usually the most exciting topic, but it's very hard to hide from in modern business. Our next speaker is a best-selling author whose work has been featured and read by millions of people. He's taught at UC Berkeley, at Stanford, and his work has been featured in Fast Company, The Irish Times, and Lifehacker. Forbes has called him one of the best public speaking coaches out there. That's pretty impressive, especially when you consider how ironic it is because he hates public speaking. So to overcome his own fears, he created a methodology to hack public speaking and get better at it. And he's here to share it with us today. So here to tell you how you can do the same, please join me in welcoming David Nahiel. Thank you. Hello, Lisbon. Round of applause for turning up for this very sexy topic. Oh, yeah. Okay, not exactly sexy, but very hard to hide from in modern business. So I want to show you a few ways to get through it, whether you love it or you hate it. The really good news is the bar out there for public speaking is so low. It's ridiculous. You can look good pretty fast. You can literally go on LinkedIn and add the name public speaker to your profile. That's it. There you go. You can add keynote speaker. Someone might even pay you now. But more seriously, there's a couple of things, if you know them, that'll make you look pretty decent at it, whether you really love it or you hate it. And we want to get into those. If you don't mind me asking by show of hands, how many people have taken some form of public speaking training before? Let me see it. Cool. Put them down. By show of hands, how many people speak English as a second language? I'm from Ireland, so arguably me too. <laughs> For those of you that have taken some form of public speaking training, a lot of people focus on delivery. So they'll come to you and they're like, make eye contact with people. Hold the eye contact. Really freak them out. <laughs> Look at the emotional trauma I've caused this lady already. Just one moment. They'll be like, smile, move your arms a certain way like this. It's very important to remember in public speaking that rubbish content delivered beautifully is still rubbish. Hugely important to focus on what you're going to say and forget for the moment about how you're going to say it. So we need to know a few things when we're creating content. We want to base it around this. The brain does not pay attention to boring things. So you might think your pie chart is extremely sexy. You're like, oh, look at it, the way it goes up, and then it goes down, it goes up again. Oh, I didn't see that coming. Amazing. Right? You might think the figures are key, and they are, but on bringing somebody into your story or telling them your message, it's not. Your brain simply doesn't pay attention to boring things. So we want to shortcut this process a little bit. We're going to do it using the 80-20 principle. So if you're not familiar with it, it's focusing on the 20% of the things that give you 80% of the results. So by way of we example on that, just what makes the biggest difference and forget about everything else. So for those of you who don't speak Portuguese, you might have heard this one when you arrive. Você fala Portuguese? You're like, I don't. I don't know what you're saying to me. This what happened to me when you arrive, so you try and learn rapidly. Imagine you had to learn Portuguese quickly. It's not easy. So if I told you the word in Portuguese for to fit is caber, right? Anyone who speaks Portuguese, I imagine 50% of the audience, is that correct? Don't ever trust an Irish person talking about Portuguese. That's correct, caber. Nearly impossible to remember the word caber, but if you turn it into a story, something that's more familiar to your mind, take two words from the English language for our English language speakers, cab, taxi cab, and a bear, like a big hairy bear. So New York, picture downtown, picture a skyscraper, picture a yellow taxi cab, the old school 1980s ones pulling up, and a big hairy bear comes running out of a building and tries to get in the back of the taxi. He doesn't fit, so the taxi driver is having a bit of an emotional breakdown. It's like, bear, what are you doing? You do not fit in taxi cab or some other inappropriate accent that I can't do. And at that moment, the bear's hairy bottom is sticking out of the window of the taxi cab, right? He's not going to fit in the taxi cab. The bear does not fit in the cab. Cab bear is the word for to fit. You visualize that story, and you will remember that connection for the rest of your life. 
So if you're public speaking and you're not telling a story in a way that someone can visualize and remember the story, then you're kind of wasting your time because they can't retell it to anybody else. So when you're hacking this process, 80-20 principle, we always want to start with a story. So that's your, so your facts and your figures and your metrics and your growth rates, especially when you're pitching, they're the icing on the cake. Remember that. That's how you seal the deal, but you've got to build a story to get people involved with your message. Those stories have to be short. You'll always hear people talking about storytelling and the hero's journey. Keep them short. Use comedy writing techniques. So we're going to use comedy writing techniques because the true masters of public speaking, if you believe in Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours rule, the real people who are only on stage that amount are comedians. They're on stage every night, and they're the only ones that usually clock up that amount of time. They use a lot the hard way, but they're forced to be concise. So are you in pitching your business. On average, you have a three-minute pitch. So first, we want you to pay attention. Treat it like a bit of a joke. So you have the setup and the punchline. You have the backstory and the main point. You're going to follow the same format when you're creating your story. So the minimum amount of information to get to your key point. That should be three lines and no more. Ideally, you want to delay the impact words until the end. That's what makes comedians timing look great. It what makes professional speakers look great. Take the key word and move it to the end. Imagine I had a company and I want to stress to you something important about it. And I say we had an 80% growth rate year on year. What do you think is the key point in there? I freaked you out emotionally earlier. Maybe you can tell me, have you recovered? 80% growth rate year on year, you're like 80% seems like the key word, but it gets lost in the sentence. It's very easy for me to say 80% growth rate year on year and then just keep talking and you don't take any note of it. So what I'm saying to do here is take out the key word, move it to the end of the sentence, 80%. So you would now say we had a growth rate year on year of 80% creates a natural pause, people will literally write it down in front of your eyes because you've told them it's important. Just raising your voice on the keyword, move the keyword to the end. Another thing that comedy writers will do is they will always use the rule of three, which inconveniently for me, even though I've lost my voice over the last few days, is a number that Irish people cannot pronounce. The rule of three. We try, we just can't do it properly. Three is the smallest number of elements it creates to create a pattern. Once you have three elements, you know there's a pattern. So if I say to you, one, two, you expect three, and I say four, now I'm breaking a pattern and it becomes even more memorable. If I say one, two, four, you realize I was multiplying the numbers, but only retrospectively. That's comedy. Comedy is always one, two, create the pattern, apples, apples, four, oranges, change it and break the pattern. So if you ever want to be funny in public speaking, and public speakers, anybody who gets paid to do it is always funny. Every one of the top 10 TED Talks is funny. Some of them are even funnier than the world's funniest movies when you measure the metrics on it. So if you want to play around with anything funny, it's always one, two, four. So these elements combine. I just want to show you that in action because it's very hard to explain but very easy to see it. I want to show you with a president of the United States. Don't worry, not that president. The only way you can date her in photos is by looking at me. Take a look. Here we are in 2008. Here we are a few years later. And this one is from two weeks ago. So again, not viral hilarity, but it's guaranteed to create a laugh. One, two, four. It's memorable and it's a flip of direction. And you can use this stuff anywhere. I ended up writing a book about public speaking. I wish I wrote a book about something more exciting. That way my family would probably still talk to me. But and when you write a book, you're meant to get famous people to say nice things about your book. So of course I tried. Here's the back. One famous person, two famous person. Number three, this book is great. I haven't read it yet. But David drew a picture when he was six years old of a penguin drinking beer in a Chinese restaurant, and it was clear the potential for slight wisdom and misguided creativity were there. Marita Nihil, David's mother. What happens if I put her line number one? I am a nutcase. 
That's right. I'm selling no books. The publisher is not allowing me to do it. So violating that pattern is the difference between something being weird and something being funny and memorable. But always try and use the rule of three in any content you're creating. Three items is always memorable than any other number of items. So when it comes to delivering this stuff, now that you've known, okay, I want to create some content, we want to make you look very comfortable. So comfortable you look discomfortable. To do that, the start is super, super important. And if you're a nervous public speaker, I would suggest memorize the first 30 seconds. If you're lazy on preparation time, you're busy with your company, you don't have time, word for word, memorize the first 30 seconds. Otherwise, you can walk out and I see all of you and panic sets in. And I'm like, oh, hello. It's uh, great to be here today. Thank you for having me. Sorry, I talked to you. I didn't mean to earlier. I was emotional. Sorry. Thanks to the organizers for having me. And you're already like, this is crap. So you want to avoid that because your nerves are so elevated in the first 30 seconds. Decide what you're going to say and stick to that. Outsource your intro. If you've ever seen people pitching, they tend to come on and talk about themselves. It's like reading a LinkedIn resume. Hi, I'm John. I'm the founder of this company. I went to school and I have a degree in art history and I like cheese and cucumbers and Starbucks coffee. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Why are you telling me this? You nearly feel like you're being sold to. So if you can, outsource your introduction. Ask the organizers to tell them what gives you your credentials to speak about it and who you are so that you don't have to walk out and spend time telling them who you are. I just like sheep, so I have one in here. Cut the fluff. Very important. So I don't know if you heard about this. There was a monster in New Zealand. He was roaming around for six years. Nobody found this monster. And when they finally found him, this is him. Shrek the sheep, and he was a bit of a hairy monster. And then they sheared him for charity, and they brought him on live television, and they cut all his wool off, and he became this. Only a fraction of the little sheep he used to be. This is your talk. This is your pitch. This is your speech. If you ever have the joy of working with Ted or one of these professional organizations or a book editor or a speech editor, they're going to turn it into this. Right? And the way to do that, it's very, if you don't have the luxury of someone to give you feedback, score everything in your talk or presentation from one to five. Five is people like it. Five is people tweet about it. They ask you questions about it. They come up to you and comment about it. Four, they're liking it. You're liking it. It has to be in there. One and two, does it really need to be in there? Nobody's ever mentioned it. So make it a metric system and everything that's a one and a two, just cut it out. Easy. So use that rating system. Any of you have a problem using filler words when public speaking? Ah, uh, eh, uh, but, by show of hands, me, I definitely do. Irish people were remorse. We use dirty words sometimes when we're nervous. If you want to fix that, you simply speak at an elevated tone. A little bit hard for me to do today because I'm hoarse. But once I raise my voice, it is impossible for me to say out loud the word, uh. It'll nearly blow your own brain out. So all you have to do is raise your voice and that immediately fixes that problem. Just a nice little hack. Most people's biggest fear on public speaking is going blank on stage. That's because they've written out bullet points. They're staring at the bullet points just before they go on stage. They're super nervous. It's very hard to remember just a word. You guys have already used a technique to get over this. Can you all say for me together on the count of three, the word for to fit in Portuguese? One, two, three. You guys are real good at Portuguese. Vocês já falam Portuguese. The technique is called the memory palace. It involves creating a story around any bit of content you need to remember, and then you go one further. You take the ground floor plan of the house you live in, or the office you work in, or a building very familiar to you, and that becomes the floor plan of your talk. So start with the bullet points, create a story for every bullet point, and then put the bullet point in a place so that you're walking around sequentially, clockwise or anti-clockwise. That way, when you get nervous, you're never asking yourself, what's the next word to say? You're asking yourself, where am I in the building? And that's very easy. You're like, oh, I went to the kitchen. There's a guy with a suspicious Irish Middle Eastern accent driving a taxi cab and a hairy bear. OK, I need to talk about that. And it looks a bit like this. So all I will ever have for preparation for a talk is a picture of my house. That was a story about my mother. Uh, a bit unusual. She visited me in San Francisco, and it's a very liberal place there. By the time she went back to Ireland, she was eating cannabis cookies and wearing yoga pants. And yeah, I haven't brought her back yet. My dad won't let me. But that's the general plan. 
all you're doing is visualizing yourself walking around. Very, very important. Another thing on pitching and presenting, you often get stuck behind a podium. Never, ever, ever speak from behind a podium. People need to see you to trust you. Who speaks from behind podiums usually? Politicians, lecturers, priests. Not exactly high on entertainment levels normally. Right? There are a few, but get rid of it. So you watch a TED talk, you notice they only have a slide advancer. Your way around this is don't rely on the venue to have a slide advancer or a clicker. Buy your own, it'll be the best 40 euros you ever spent, and just bring it with you every time. That changes the dynamics of every meeting. You do not want to be sat there behind a desk advancing slides. Another animal for you, do not pet hamsters. Sounds like you think you don't do it, but when you get nervous and you go on stage, you put your hands together like you're rubbing a little imaginary furry hamster. Everybody does it. The way not to do it is to practice with a bottle in each hand or a glass in each hand, and then every time they bang together, you become conscious that you're doing it. So when actors are getting ready for camera work, that's how they prepare. They hold a glass or a bottle in each hand. Very important, acknowledge the obvious. If something is going horribly wrong when you're up there, if you have a stain on you, you just spilled something on your shirt, your fly is open, the audiovisual equipment working isn't working, somebody's asleep in the front row, say it. You have to say it. If the audience can see it, you get easy points for acknowledging it. All right, don't ignore it. And I want to show you an example of that. This is the most extreme example of hamster petting you're ever going to see in a high stakes environment, but just watch the difference between acknowledging the obvious, that puts the audience at ease, even if you're being pretty weird. Thank you uh, so much, uh, everyone from Ted and Chris and Amy in particular, I cannot believe uh, uh, I'm here, I have not slept in weeks. Uh, Neil and I were sitting there comparing how little we've slept uh, in anticipation for this. I've never been so nervous, uh, and I do this when I'm nervous, I just realized. Um, <laughs> hugely important, that was some aggressive hamster pattern, wasn't it? But hugely important, Dave Eggers, a very influential guy, amazing writer, great speaker, but you're, you're distracted by what he's doing unless he acknowledges it. So if you, something's going wrong, talk about it. Have you ever seen the moment out of an end of a talk when someone's pitching or presenting and they're left standing there for questions and answers and they're awkward and it's like, anyone got any questions for the speaker? And they're just standing there like that. And the host kicks into action and they're like, anybody there? You? And they're like, no, it wasn't me. Leave me alone. And then I, as the speaker, just go, okay, God, that was awkward and leave. And then someone shouts something and then I have to come back. Oh, I'm back. I'm back. Is it a question? Never finish on questions and answers. Imagine you two, I'm going to give you an Irish band to be stereotypically Irish. Would they write a new album and go on tour all around the world of 10 songs and go to Madison Square Garden and play nine songs and bring the audience to the exact moment of excitement and then to stop and go, anyone, anyone here sing or play an instrument? Anyone want to bring this one home? It would be insanity. You have to control the ending. So as a statement you can use that will change your life in public speaking. Always say the words, I'm going to take a few questions before I make my conclusion. You save a slide, and that way you always have something if there's no questions. It's no longer an awkward moment. So I'm going to take a few questions before I make my conclusion. Change your life in the world of public speaking. Now, I know this is a lot, but I think they're the tips that make the biggest difference if we're going to 80-20 principle this. And at the very end, I'll put up a slide with a link, and you can download way more for free. Uh, if you want a summary, some of you won't have a clue what I said with the dodgy Irish accent. No worries, but all the information is there. I love this example. Roses are red, bacon is red, poems are hard, bacon. <laughs> They've tried to do the things I've told you about, and it kind of worked, and then they failed, and then they acknowledged the failure, and it's still entertaining. <laughs> Please remember, in the world of public speaking, the audience is always on your side, they want to see you do well. And I can tell you this all day and you'll never believe me. So here is the best example of how long people will wait to see you do well. Ha, <laughs> ha, 
Oh, God, I love that man. So that is hacking public speaking, ladies and gentlemen. Please, if you're pitching or presenting or you're trying to pass on information that you got from an Irish person about Portuguese that sounds a little bit suspicious, remember, start with a story, find the key point, and use comedy techniques. Because at the end of the day, public speaking is just speaking. Thank you very much. And there's that link that I promised you. Thank you. <laughs>